Hello everybody and happy Monday. I am coming to you from the future. No, the past. You're in the future. I'm in the past because when I'm recording this, I am in dreary spring Michigan and it's March still and it's just gross. But at the time that you actually watch this, I will be in very sunny Florida and I'm really hoping it's awesome. Anywho, we are reading along. We are read along and I am Miss Natalie from Kalamazoo Public Library. Our series is The Trials of Apollo by Rick Riordan, book one, The Hidden Oracle. And when we finished up our chapters last time, we found out that Meg probably knows who the Beast is, which is the guy in this like purple suit. We figured out that there is a fifth oracle in the world. So they said there were four oracles, according to Python, that monster that Apollo fought. Uh, there were four oracles in the entire world. He has four of them under his control, but the fifth oracle is this grove of trees called Dodona. And that's all we know. Apollo knows a little bit about it, sort of, but not enough for us to figure it out. So let's get reading. And of course, just a reminder, we are only doing videos on Mondays and Wednesdays, but we're going to have slightly longer videos. So I hope that meets your guys' approval. Cat pictures. I'm going to come back from vacation in a couple weeks, which is really just a few days for you guys. Man, this is confusing. Time. And I should have new pictures of my adorable ones. For instance, my niece, whose name is Natalie as well, and we call her Little Nat, she purchased these really cute bow tie collars for the cats, so I need to get some nice pictures. Because Mr. Business, in a pizza bow tie, he looks pretty dapper. And finally, contact information. Find me on Instagram, find the library, get a hold of me, tell me about your life, send me pictures. I absolutely love it. Chapter 19. They have gone missing? No, 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 etc. The only biohazards we encountered were vegan cupcakes. After navigating several torchlit corridors, we burst into a crowded modern bakery that, according to the menu board, had the dubious name, The Level 10 Vegan. Our garbage volcanic gas stench quickly dispersed the customers driving most toward the exit, and causing many non-dairy, gluten-free baked goods to be trampled. We ducked behind the counter, charged through the kitchen doors, and found ourselves in a subterranean amphitheater that looks centuries old. Tiers of stone seats ringed a sandy pit about the size for a gladiator fight. Hanging from the ceiling were dozens of thick iron chains. I wondered what ghastly spectacles might have been staged here, but we didn't stay very long. We limped out the opposite side, back into the labyrinth's twisting corridors. By this point, we had perfected the art of three-legged running. Whenever I started to tire, I imagined Python behind us, spewing poisonous gas. At last, we turned a corner, and Meg shouted, There! In the middle of the corridor sat a third golden apple. This time, I was too exhausted to care about traps. We loped forward until Meg scooped up the fruit. In front of us, the ceiling lowered, forming a ramp. Fresh air filled my lungs. We climbed to the top, but instead of feeling elevated, my insides turned as cold as the garbage juice on my skin. We were back in the woods. Not here, I muttered. Gods, no. Meg hopped us in a full circle. Maybe it's a different forest. But it wasn't. I could feel the resentful stare of the trees, the horizon stretching out in all directions. Voices began to whisper, waking to our presence. Hurry, I said. As if on cue, the bands around our legs sprang loose. We ran. Even with her arms full of apples, Meg was faster. She veered between trees, zigzagging left and right, as if following a course only she could see. My legs ached and my chest burned, but I didn't dare fall behind. Up ahead, flickering points of light resolved into torches. At last, we burst out of the woods, right into a crowd of campers and satyrs. Chiron galloped over, 
thank the gods. You're welcome, I gasped, mostly out of habit. Chiron, we have to talk. In the torchlight, the centaur's face seemed carved from shadow. Yes, we do, my friend. But first, I fear one more team is still missing. Your children, Kayla and Austin. Chiron forced us to take showers and change clothes. Otherwise, I would have plunged straight back into the woods. By the time I was done, Kayla and Austin still had not returned. Chiron had sent search parties of dryads into the forest, on the one assumption that they would be safe in their home and territory, but he adamantly refused to let demigods join the hunt. We cannot risk anyone else, he said. Kayla, Austin, and, and the other missing. They would not want that. Five campers had now disappeared. I harbored no illusions that Kaylin and Austin would return on their own. The beast's words still echoed in my ears. I have upped the stakes. Apollo will have no choice. Somehow he had targeted my children. He was inviting me to look for them and to find the gates of this hidden oracle. There was still so much I did not understand. How the ancient grove of Dodona had relocated here. What sort of gates it might have. Why the beast thought I could open them and how he'd snared Austin and Kayla. But there was one thing I did know. The beast was right. I had no choice. I had to find my children, my friends. I would have ignored Chiron's warning and run into the forest except for Will's panicked shout, Apollo, I need you. At the far end of the field, he had set up an impromptu hospital where half a dozen campers lay injured on the stretchers. He was frantically tending to Paolo Montes, while Nico held down the screaming patient. I ran to Will's side and winced at what I saw. Paolo had managed to get one of his legs sawed off. I got it reattached, Will told me, his voice shaky with exhaustion. His scrubs were speckled with blood. I need somebody to keep him stable. I pointed to the woods, but... I know, Will snapped. Don't you think I want to be out there searching too? We're shorthanded for healers. There's some salve and nectar in that pack. Go. I was stunned by his tone. I realized he was just as concerned about Kayla and Austin as I was. The only difference, Will knew his duty. He had to heal the injured first, and he needed my help. Y yes, I said. Yes, of course. I grabbed the supply pack and took charge of Paolo, who had conveniently passed out from the pain. Will changed his surgical gloves and glared at the woods. We will find them. We have to. Nico D'Angelo gave him a canteen. Drink. Right now, this is where you need to be. I could tell the son of a Hades was angry, too. Around his feet, the grass steamed and withered. Will sighed. You're right, but that doesn't make me feel better. I have to set Valentina's broken arm now. You want to assist? Sounds gruesome, Nico said. Let's go. I tended to Paolo Montes until I was sure he was out of danger then asked two satyrs to carry a stretcher to the heavy cabin. I did what I could to nurse the others. Kiara had a mild concussion. Billy Ng had come down with a case of Irish step dancing. Holly and Laurel needed pieces of shrapnel removed from their backs, thanks to a close encounter with an exploding chainsaw frisbee. The Victor twins had placed in first, predictably, but they also demanded to know which of them had the most pieces of shrapnel extracted, so they could have bragging rights. I told them to be quiet or I would never allow them to wear laurel wreaths again. As the guy who held the patent on laurel wreaths, that was my prerogative. I found my mortal healing skills were passable. Will Solis far, far outshone me, but that didn't bother me as much as my failures with archery and music had. I suppose I was used to being second in healing. My son, Asclepius, had become the god of medicine by the time he was 15, and I couldn't have been happier for him. It left me time for my other interests. Besides, it's every god's dream to have a child who grows up to be a doctor. As I was washing up from shrapnel extraction, Harley shuffled over, fiddling with his beacon device. His eyes got were puffy from crying. It's my fault, he muttered. I, can lo I got them lost. I, I'm sorry. He was shaking. I realized the little boy was terrified of what I might do. For the past two days, I had yearned to cause fear in mortals again. My stomach had boiled with resentment and bitterness. I wanted someone to blame for my predicament, for the disappearances, 
for my own powerlessness to fix things. Looking at Harley, my anger evaporated. I felt hollow, silly, ashamed of myself. Yes, me, Apollo, ashamed. Truly, it was an event so unprecedented it should have ripped apart the cosmos. It's all right, I told him. He sniffled. The race course went into the woods. It shouldn't have done that. They got lost and... Harley, I placed my hands over his. May I see your beacon? He blinked the tears away. I guess he was afraid I might smash his gadget, but he let me take it. I am not an inventor, I said, turning the gears as gently as possible. I don't have your father's skills, but I do know music. I believe automatons prefer a frequency of E at 329.6 hertz. It resonates best with celestial bronze. If you adjust your signal... Festus might hear it? Harley's eyes widened. Really? I don't know, I admitted. Just as you could not have known what the labyrinth would do today. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying. Never stop inventing, son of Hephaestus. I gave him back his beacon. For a count of three, Harley stared at me in disbelief. Then he hugged me so hard he nearly rebroke my ribs, and he dashed away. I tended to the last of the injured while the harpies cleaned the area, picking up bandages, torn clothing, and damaged weapons. They gathered the golden apples in a basket, and promised to bake us some lovely golden apple turnovers for breakfast. At Chiron's urging, the remaining campers dispersed back to their cabins. He promised them we would determine what to do in the morning, but I had no intention of waiting. As soon as we were alone, I turned to Chiron and Meg. I'm going after Kayla and Austin, I told them. You can join me or not. Chiron's expression tightened. My friend, you're exhausted and unprepared. Go back to your cabin. It will serve no purpose. No. I waved him off, as I once might have done when I was a god. The gesture probably looked petulant coming from a 16-year-old nobody, but I didn't care. I have to do this. The centaur lowered his head. I should have listened to you before the race. You tried to warn me. What? What did you discover? The question stopped my momentum like a seatbelt. After rescuing Sherman Yang, after listening to Python in the labyrinth, I had felt certain I knew the answers. I had remembered the name Dodona, the stories about talking trees. Now my mind was once again a bowl of fuzzy mortal soup. I couldn't recall what I'd been so excited about, or what I had intended to do about it. Perhaps exhaustion and stress had taken their toll. Or maybe Zeus was manipulating my brain, allowing me tantalizing glimpses of the truth, then snatching them away turning my aha moments into huh moments. I've hollowed in frustration. I don't remember. Meg and Chiron exchanged nervous glances. You're not going, Meg told me firmly. What? You can't? That's an order, she said. Not going into the woods until I say so. The command sent a shudder from the base of my skull to my heels. I dug my fingernails into my palms. Meg McCaffrey, if my children die because you wouldn't let me... Like Chiron said, you're just going to get yourself killed. We'll wait for daylight. I thought how, sad, how satisfying it would be to drop Meg from the sun chariot at high noon. Then again, some small rational part of me realized she might be right. I was in no condition to launch a one-man rescue operation. That just made me angrier. Chiron's tail swished from side to side. Well, then, I will see you both in the morning. We will find a solution. I promise you that. He gave me one last look, as if worried I might start running in circles and baying at the moon. Then he trotted back toward the big house. I scowled at Meg. I'm staying out here tonight, in case Kayla and Austin come back, unless you want to forbid me from doing that, too. She only shrugged. Even her shrugs were annoying. I stormed off to the me cabin and grabbed a few supplies. A flashlight, two blankets, a canteen of water. As an afterthought, I took a few books from Will Solis's bookshelf. No surprise, he kept reference materials about me to share with new campers. I thought perhaps the books might help jog my memories. Failing that, they'd make good tinder for a fire. When I returned to the edge of the woods, Meg was still there. I hadn't expected her to keep vigil with me. Being Meg, 
she had apparently decided it was the best way to irritate me. She ne sat next to me on my blanket and began eating a golden apple, which she had hidden in her coat. Winter mist drifted through the trees. The night breeze rippled across the grass, making pattern like waves. Under different circumstances, I might have written a poem about it. In my present state of mind, I could only have managed a, fu a funeral dirge, and I did not want to think about death. I tried to stay mad at Meg, but I couldn't manage it. I suppose she'd had my best interests at heart. Or at least, she wasn't ready to see her new godly servant get himself killed. She didn't try to console me. She asked me no questions. She amused herself by picking up small rocks and tossing them into the woods. That I didn't mind. I happily would have given her a catapult if I had one. As the night wore on, I read about myself in Will's books. Normally, this would have been a happy task. I am, after all, a fascinating subject. This time, however, I gained no satisfaction from my glorious exploits. They all seemed like exaggerations, lies, and, well, myths. Unfortunately, I found a chapter about oracles. Those few pages stirred my memory, confirming my worst suspicions. I was too angry to be terrified. I stared at the wo woods and dared the whispering voices to disturb me. I thought, come on, then. Take me, too. The trees remained silent. Kayla and Austin did not return. Toward dawn, it started to snow. Only then did Meg speak. We should go inside. And abandon them? Don't be stupid. So stalted the hood of her winter coat. Her face was hidden except for the tip of her nose and the glint of rhinestones on her glasses. You'll freeze out here. I noticed she didn't complain about the cold herself. I wondered if she even felt uncomfortable, or if the power of Demeter kept her safe through the winter like a leafless tree, or a dormant seed in the earth. They were my children. It hurt me to use the past tense, but Kayla and Austin felt irretrievably lost. I should have done more to protect them. I should have anticipated that my enemies would target them to hurt me. Meg chucked another rock at the trees. You've had a lot of children. You take the blame every time one of them gets in trouble? The answer was no. Over the millennia, I had barely managed to remember my children's names. If I sent them an occasional birthday card or a magic flute, I felt really good about myself. Sometimes I wouldn't realize one of them had died until decades later. During the French Revolution, I got worried about my boy Louis the fifth or fourteenth, the Sun King, then went down to check on him and found out he had died 75 years earlier. Now, though, I had a mortal conscience. My sense of guilt seemed to have expanded as my lifespan contracted. I couldn't explain that to Meg. She would never understand. She'd probably just throw a rock at me. It's my fault Python retook Delphi, I said. If I had killed him the moment he reappeared while I was still a god, he would never have become so powerful. He would never have made an alliance with this, this beast. Meg lowered her face. You know him, I guessed. In the labyrinth, when you heard the beast's voice, you were terrified. I was worried she might order me to shut up again. Instead, she silently traced the crescents on her gold rings. Meg, he wants to destroy me, I said. Somehow he's behind these disappearances. The more we understand about this man... He lives in New York. I waited. It was difficult to glean much information from the top of Meg's hood. All right, I said. That narrows it down to eight and a half million people. What else? Meg picked at the calluses on her fingers. If you're a demigod on the streets, you hear about the beast. He takes people like me. A snowflake melted on the back of my neck. Takes people? Why? To train. Meg said, to use, like, servants, soldiers. I don't know. And you've met him. Please don't ask me. Meg, he killed my dad. Her words were quiet, but they hit me harder than a rock in the face. Meg, I, I'm sorry. How? I refused to work for him, she said. My dad tried to. She closed her fists. I was really small. I hardly remember it. I got away. Otherwise, the beast would have killed me, too. My stepdad took me in. He was good to me. 
You asked why he trained me to fight? Why he gave me the rings? He wanted me to be safe, to be able to protect myself. From the beast. Her hood dipped. Being a good demigod, training hard, that's the only way to keep the beast away. Now you know. In fact, I had more questions than ever, but I sensed that Meg was in no mood for further sharing. I remembered her expression as we stood on that ledge under the chamber of Delphi, her look of absolute terror when she recognized the beast's voice. Not all monsters were three-ton reptiles with poisonous breath. Many wore human faces. I peered into the woods. Somewhere in there, five demigods were being used as bait, including two of my children. The beast wanted me to search for them, and I would, but I would not let him use me. I have well-placed help within the camp, the beast had said. That bothered me. I knew from experience that any demigod who could be turned against Olympus. I had been at the banquet table when Tantalus tried to poison the gods by feeding us his chopped-up son in a stew. I had watched as King Mithridates sided with the Persians and massacred every Roman in Anatolia. I had witnessed Queen Clamonestra turning homicidal, killing her husband Agamemnon just because he had made one little human sacrifice to me. Demigods are such an unpredictable bunch. I glanced at Meg. I wondered if she could be lying to me, if she was some sort of spy. It seemed unlikely. She was too contrary, impetuous, and annoying to be an effective mole. Besides, she was technically my master. She could order me to do almost any task and I would have to obey. If she was out to destroy me, I was already as good as dead. Perhaps Damien White, a son of Nemesis, was a natural choice for backstabbing duty. Or Connor Stoll, Alice, or Julia. A child of Hermes had recently betrayed the gods by working for Kronos. They might do so again. Maybe that pretty Kiara, daughter of Tyche, was in league with the Beast. Children of luck were natural gamblers. The truth was, I had no idea. The sky turned to black, or turned black from gray. I became aware of a distant thump, thump, thump. A quick, relentless pulse that got louder and louder. At first, I feared it might be the blood in my head. Could human brains explode from too many worrisome thoughts? Then I realized the noise was mechanical, coming from the west. In the distinctly modern sound of rotor blades cutting the air, Meg lifted her head. Is that a helicopter? I got to my feet. The machine appeared. A dark red Bell 412 cutting north along the coastline. Riding the skies as often as I do, I know my flying machines. Painted on the helicopter's side was a bright green logo with the letters D-E. Despite my misery, a small bit of hope kindled inside me. The satyrs Millard and Herbert must have succeeded in delivering their message. That, I told Meg, is Rachel Elizabeth Dare. Let's go see what the Oracle of Delphi has to say. Ooh, okay. All right, so this was a slightly longer chapter than we expected. We're going to do one more, and then we'll be done, okay? Oh, man, I really wonder what happened next. Chapter 20. Don't paint over gods if you're redecorating. That's like common sense. Rachel Elizabeth Dare was one of my favorite mortals. As soon as she'd become the Oracle two summers ago, she'd brought new vigor and excitement to the job. Of course, the previous Oracle had been a withered corpse, so perhaps the bar was low. Regardless, I was elated as the Dare Enterprise's helicopter descended just beyond the eastern hills, outside the camp's boundary. I wondered what Rachel had told her father a fabulously wealthy real estate magnate, to convince him she needed to borrow a helicopter. I knew Rachel could be quite convincing. I jogged across the valley with Meg in tow. I could already imagine the way Rachel would look as she came over the summit. Her frizzy red hair, her vivacious smile, her paint-spattered blouse, and jeans covered with doodles. I needed her humor, wisdom, and resilience. The Oracle would cheer us all up. Most importantly, she would cheer me up. I was not prepared for the reality, which again was a stunning surprise. Normally, reality prepares itself for me. Rachel met us on the hill near the entrance to her cave. Only later would I realize Chiron's two satyr messengers were not with her, and I would wonder what had happened to them. Miss Dare looked thinner and older. 
less like a high school girl and more like a young farmer's wife from ancient times, weathered from hard work and gaunt from shortage of food. Her red hair had lost its vibrancy. It framed her face in a curtain of dark copper. Her freckles had faded to watermarks. Her green eyes did not sparkle, and she was wearing a dress, a white cotton frock with a white shawl, and a patina green jacket. Rachel never wore dresses. Rachel? I didn't trust myself to say any more. She was not the same person. Then I remembered that I wasn't either. She studied my new mortal form. Her shoulders slumped. So it's true. From below us came the voices of other campers, no doubt woken by the sound of the helicopter. They were emerging from their cabins and gathering at the base of the hill. None tried to climb toward us, though. Perhaps they all sensed that all was not right. The helicopter from behind Half Blood or er, rose behind from or er, from behind Half Blood Hill. Ugh. It veered toward Long Island Sound, passing so close to the Athena Parthenos that I thought its landing skids might clip the goddess's winged helmet. I turned to Meg. Would you tell the others that Rachel needs some space? Fetch Chiron. He should come up. The rest should wait. It wasn't like Meg to take orders from me. I half expected her to kick me. Instead, she glanced nervously at Rachel, turned, and trudged down the hill. A friend of yours? Rachel asked. Long story. Yes, she said. I have a story like that, too. Shall we talk in your cave? Rachel pursed her lips. You won't like it, but yes, that's probably the safest place. The cave was not as cozy as I remembered. The sofas were overturned. The coffee table had a broken leg. The floors were strewn with easels and canvases. Even Rachel's tripod stool, the throne of prophecy itself, sat on its side in a pile of paint-spattered dropcloths. Most disturbing was the state of the walls. Ever since taking up residence, Rachel had been painting them, like her cave-dwelling ancestors of old. She had spent hours on elaborate murals of events from the past images and futures she had seen in prophecies, favorite quotes from books and music, and abstract designs so good they would have given M. C. Esker vertigo. The art made the cave feel like a mixture of art studio, psychedelic hangout, and graffiti-covered highway underpass. I loved it. But most of the images had been blotted out with a sloppy coat of white paint. Nearby, a roller was stuck in an encrusted tray. Clearly, Rachel had defaced her own work months ago and hadn't been back since. She waved listlessly at the wreckage. I got frustrated. Your art! I gaped at the field of white. There was a lovely portrait of me, right there. I get offended whenever art is damaged, especially, especially if that art features me. Rachel looked ashamed. I, I thought a blank canvas might help me think. Her tone made it obvious that the whitewashing had accomplished nothing. I could have told her as much. The two of us did our best to clean up. We hauled the sofas back into place to form a sitting area. Rachel left the tripod stool where it lay. A few minutes later, Meg returned. Chiron followed in full centaur form, ducking his head to fit through the entrance. They found us sitting at the wobbly coffee table like civilized cave people, sharing lukewarm Arizona tea and stale crackers from the Oracle's larder. Rachel, Chiron sighed with relief. Where are Millard and Herbert? She bowed her head. They arrived at my house badly wounded. They, they didn't make it. Perhaps it was the morning light behind him, but I fancied I could see new gray whiskers growing in Chiron's beard. The centaur trotted over and lowered himself to the ground, folding his legs underneath himself. Meg joined me on the couch. Rachel leaned forward and steepled her fingers, as she did when she spoke of prophecy. I half hoped the spirit of Delphi would possess her, but there was no smoke, no hissing, no raspy voice of divine possession. It was a bit disappointing. You first, she told us. Tell me what's been going on here. We brought her up to speed on the disappearances and my misadventures with Meg. I explained about the three-legged race and our side trip to Delphi. Chiron blanched. I did not know this. You went to Delphi? Rachel stared at me in disbelief. The Delphi. You saw Python and you... 
I got the strange feeling she wanted to say, and you didn't kill him? But she restrained herself. I felt like standing with my face against the wall. Perhaps Rachel could blot me out with white paint. Disappearing would have been less painful than facing my failures. At present, I said, I cannot defeat Python. I am much too weak. And, well, the Catch-88. Chiron sipped his Arizona tea. Apollo means that we cannot send a quest without a prophecy, and we cannot get a prophecy without an oracle. Rachel stared at her overturned tripod stool. And this man, the beast, what do you know about him? Not much, I explained. I explained what I had seen in my dream, and what Meg and I had overheard in the labyrinth. The beast apparently has a reputation for snatching up young demigods in New York, Meg says. I faltered when I saw her expression, clearly cautioning me to stay away from her personal history. Um, she's had some experiences with the beast. Chiron raised his brows. Can you tell us anything that might help, dear? Meg sank into the sofa cushions. I've crossed paths with him. He's... he's scary. The memory is blurry. Blurry, Chiron repeated. Meg became very interested in the cracker crumbs on her dress. Rachel gave me a quizzical look. I shook my head, trying my best to impart a warning. Trauma, don't ask. Might get attacked by a peach baby. Rachel seemed to get the message. That's all right, Meg, she said. I have some information that may help. She fished her phone out from her coat pocket. Don't touch this. You guys have probably figured it out, but phones are going even more haywire than usual around de or demigods. I'm not technically one of you, and even I can't place calls. I was able to take a couple of pictures, though. She turned the screen toward us. Chiron, you recognize this place? The nighttime shot showed the upper floors of a glass residential tower. Judging from the background, it was somewhere in downtown Manhattan. That is the building you described last summer, Chiron said, where you parlayed with the Romans. Yeah, Rachel said. Something didn't feel right about that place. I got to thinking, how did the Romans take over such prime Manhattan real estate on such short notice? Who owns it? I tried to contact Raina to see if she could tell me anything, but... Communication problems, Chiron guessed. Exactly. I even sent physical mail to Camp Jupiter's Dropbox in Berkeley. No response. So I asked my dad's real estate lawyers to do some digging. Meg peeked over the top of her glasses. Your dad has lawyers? And a helicopter? Several helicopters, Rachel sighed. <sighs> He's annoying. Anyway... That building is owned by a shell corporation, which is owned by another shell corporation, blah, blah, blah. The mother company is something called Triumvirate Holdings. I felt a trickle like white paint rolling down my back. Triumvirate. Meg made a sour face. What does that mean? A triumvirate is a ruling council of three, I said. At least, that's what it meant in ancient Rome. Which is interesting, Rachel said because of this next shot. She tapped her screen. The new photo zoomed in on the building's penthouse terrace, where three shadowy figures stood together talking, men in business suits, illuminated only by the light from inside the apartment. I couldn't see their faces. These are the owners of Triumvirate Holdings, Rachel said. Just getting this one picture wasn't easy. She blew a frizzy strand of hair out of her face spent the last two months investigating them, and I don't even know their names. I don't know where they live or where they come from, but I can tell you they own so much property and have so much money, they make my dad's company look like a kid's lemonade stand. I stared at the shape of the three shadowy figures. I could almost imagine that the one on the left was the beast. His slouching posture and the over-large shape of his head reminded me of the man in purple from my dream. The Beast said that his organization was everywhere, I recalled. He mentioned he had colleagues. Chiron's tail flicked, sending a paintbrush skidding across the cave floor. Adult demigods. I can't imagine they would be Greek, but perhaps Roman. If they helped Octavian with his war. Oh, they helped, Rachel said. I found a paper trail. Not much, but 
You remember those siege weapons Octavian built to destroy Camp Half-Blood? No, said Meg. I would have ignored her, but Rachel was a much more generous soul. She smiled patiently. Sorry, Meg. You seem so at home here, I forgot you're new. Basically, the Roman demigods attacked this camp with giant catapulty things called onagers. It was all a big misunderstanding. Anyway, the weapons were paid for by triumvirate holdings. Kylon frowned. That is not good. I found something even more disturbing, Rachel continued. You remember before that, during the Titan War, Luke Castellan mentioned he had backers in the mortal world? They had enough money to buy a cruise ship, helicopters, weapons. They even hired mortal mercenaries. Don't remember that either, Meg said. I rolled my eyes. Meg, we can't stop and explain every major war to you. Luke Castellan was a child of Hermes. He betrayed this camp and allied himself with the Titans. They attacked New York. Big battle. I saved the day, etc. Chiron coughed. <clears throat> At any rate, I do remember Luke claiming he had lots of supporters. We never found out who they were exactly. Now we know, Rachel said. The cruise ship, the Princess Andromeda, was property of Triumvirate Holdings. A cold sense of unease gripped me. I felt I should know something about this, but my mortal brain was betraying me again. I was more certain than ever that Zeus was toying with me, keeping my vision and memory limited. I remembered some reassurances Octavian had given me, though how easy it would be to win this little war to raise some new temples to me, how much support he had. Rachel's phone screen went dark, much like my brain, but the grainy photo remained burned into my retinas. These men had picked up an empty tube of burnt sienna paint. I'm afraid they are not modern demigods. Rachel frowned. You think they're ancient demigods who came through the doors of death, like Medea or Midas? The thing is, Triumphant Holdings has been around since way before Gaia started to wake. Decades, at least. Centuries, I said. The beast said that he'd been building his empire for centuries. The cave became so silent. I imagined the hiss of Python, the soft exhale of fumes from deep in the earth. I wished he had some background music to drown it out, jazz or classical. I would have settled for death metal polka. Rachel shook her head. Then who? I don't know, I admitted. But the beast. In my dream, he called me his forefather. He assumed I would recognize him. And if my godly memory was intact, I think I would. His demeanor, his accent, his facial structure. I have met him before, just not in modern times. Meg had grown very quiet. I got the distinct impression she was trying to disappear into the couch cushions. Normally, this would not have bothered me. But after our experience in the labyrinth, I felt guilty every time I mentioned the beast. My pesky mortal conscience must have been acting up. The name Triumvirate. I tapped my forehead, trying to shake loose information that was no longer there. The last Triumvirate I dealt with included Lepidus, Mark Antony, and my son, the original Octavian. A triumvirate is a very Roman concept, like patriotism, skullduggery, and assassination. Chiron stroked his beard. You think these men are ancient Romans? How is that possible? Hades is quite good at tracking down escaped spirits from the underworld. You would not allow three men from ancient times to run amok in the modern world for centuries. Again, I do not know. Saying this so often offended my divine sensibilities. I decided that when I returned to Olympus, I would have to gargle the bad taste of my mouth with er, Tabasco-flavored nectar. But it seems these men have been plotting against us for a very long time. They funded Luke Castellan's war. They supplied aid to Camp Jupiter when the Romans attacked Camp Half-Blood. And despite those two wars, the Triumvirate is still out there, still plotting. What if this company is the root cause of, well, everything? Chiron looked at me as if I was digging his grave. That is a very troubling thought. Could three men be so powerful? I spread my hands. You've been lived long enough to know, my friend. Gods, monsters, titans, these are always dangerous. But the greatest threat to demigods has always been other demigods. Whoever this triumvirate is, we must stop them before they take control of the oracles. Rachel sat up straight. Excuse me? Oracles plural? Ah, uh, 
Didn't I tell you about them when I was a god? Her eyes regained some of their dark green intensity. I feared she was envisioning ways she might inflict pain upon me with her art supplies. No, she said levelly. You did not tell me about them. Oh. Well, my mortal memory has been faulty, you see. I had to read some books in order to... Oracles, she repeated. Plural. I took a deep breath. I wanted to assure her that those oracles didn't mean a thing to me. Rachel was special. Unfortunately, I doubted she was in a place where she could hear that right now. I decided it was best to speak plainly. In ancient times, I said, there were many oracles. Of course, Delphi was the most famous, but there were four others of comparable power. Chiron shook his head. But those were destroyed ages ago. So I thought, I agreed. Now, I am not so sure. I believe Triumvirate Holdings wants to control all the ancient oracles. And I believe the most ancient oracle of all, the Grove of Dodona, is right here at Camp Half-Blood. Oh man, that is awesome. Okay, that is it for today. That was a little bit longer uh, than I expected of the two chapters. And we will read next time.